I was three years old when my parents bought Blanco. That's what we called our ranch house, set on five acres of land in the Texas Hill Country, about 12 minutes from the little town us gringos pronounce Blanco. <laughs> my dad had received a nice inheritance from a great uncle, which afforded my parents to fulfill their dream of having a vacation place for their children to grow up outside the hustle and bustle. They spent many weekends driving the winding roads of the hill country before landing on this special gym. It was a four and a half hour drive from Dallas. Well, four hours if my dad was driving. <laughs> there are some precious photos of my younger brother Colin asleep in the back seat of our old suburban, his big blonde head lolling on my shoulder as he clutched his blankie and treasured stuffed animal caddy. My parents took us down there on long weekends for Easter and for Thanksgiving and for the whole summer. It started out just the four of us, but quickly our family grew. My second brother, the cherubic Johnny, was born a year later, and then Spunky Sasha joined us a couple years after that. I recently watched home movies with the four of us little kids milling around my gorgeous, long, blonde-haired mother. I was astounded at how calm she was while we all vied for her attention. Mom! Mom, watch this! Hey, Mom, what's this? Mom, Mom, look at me! Her smile steady, her eyes peaceful. She was clearly at home with this breezy Blanco way of life. Blanco had been a German settlement village built in 1880 and was anchored by a grand, light-colored stone two-story house with a spacious front porch complete with a porch swing. There was a series of wood structures, structures set in an L shape that comprised the village, the smokehouse that mom turned into the kids' art studio, the workshop where dad did, did carpentry, and next to that was a two-story barn. The bottom part was open with concrete floors and food troughs and was usually covered in pellet-sized sheep or goat poop that was constantly needing sweeping up. <laughs> Once I climbed the creaky wood plank steps, I'd find a dark loft where birds and bats made their nests, and I like to act out stories. We owned Blanco for 13 years and never had a television. Upstairs, next to the kids' room, which housed four bunk beds, was a cozy closet that functioned as a playroom. Inside were dozens of books, toy sets, and a spectrum of games, from light bright to jigsaw puzzles. It was in that windowless room that I would curl up and devour everything, from Babysitter's Club to Nancy Drew to the poetry of Shel, Silver, Shel, Shel Silverstein. Those books fed my imagination and birthed a remarkable passion for reading. To further entertain ourselves, Colin and I liked to jam out to the portable stereo. <laughs> the living room in front of the fireplace became our stage. Our favorite was Huey Lewis in the news. <laughs> Colin would sing and I would choreograph an elaborate dance routine. <laughs> of course, there was always a performance involved. And as Sasha and John grew up, they caught on and joined in on the musical numbers. Johnny became famous for his tiny white boy, Gorilla Rap. And Sasha rattled off the ridiculously repetitive song she was learning in preschool. I'm my young grandpa. <laughs> Our little five acre ranch was a perfect setting for farmyard animals. We started off with a small herd of sheep. They were cute from afar, but we soon realized they were really smelly and kind of mean. So the next summer, we were determined to trade them out for something more family friendly. My dad only drove out on the weekends, so my mom was in charge during the week. <coughs> she must have looked a sight with four young children sitting among the burly male farmers at the Blanco County Livestock Auction. The auctioneer rattled off all kinds of details about it, sheep, goat, and cow as the farmers spit their chaw into their styrofoam cups. <coughs> mom valiantly bid on a handful of baby goats by raising the numbered placard she'd been given at the entrance. But when we went out back to the pens to pick them up, Mom realized we bought males. Oh no, she cried. My husband will kill me if I bring home Billy's. They're ornery and might butt one of my kids. Please, please, I made a mistake. The puckered up old auction lady gave her a stern look. I'll let you out of it this time, but next time you need to go out and take a look between their legs before you go on and bid on them. 
the two baby goats we took home were so adorable. I named mine Honey Possum because she was golden in color and she liked to play dead. <laughs> she sometimes sleeps standing up. Honey became a mama many times over, and each summer our herd of goats grew. They were much friendlier and less stinky than the sheep. She came when I called her, and I found her methodical way of chewing her cud very soothing. I even nursed her kids with a baby bottle. She was my companion, so I thought, why not try to convince Mom to let Honey in the house? <laughs> to beat the heat and nurture a growing interest in what went on outside of Texas, I started going away for a couple weeks in August to camp in Colorado. But summer life in Blanco went on without me. I had a six-pound teacup poodle called Nicole's <laughs> Little Brown Muffin, or Muffy for short. Despite being a poodle, Muffy was not prissy. She loved Blanco. She'd get burrs stuck in her fine coat from roaming through the brush. One early morning when I was at camp, Muffy went missing. My dad found her tiny body on the highway just outside the gate. <coughs> he buried her out back, crying for the first time in years. They waited till I got back home from camp to tell me. I was devastated at the loss. It was my first experience with death. Yet, it somehow felt fitting that she lost her life somewhere she was deeply happy. As I became a teenager, I got loaded down with soccer practices and dance classes and stopped going to Blanco as much. <coughs> somehow it didn't seem cool. Long drive, no TV, and all the family time. How quickly I forgot the freedom of spirit I felt there and turned my attention to trying to win friends and the attention of boys. And soon it seemed to my parents like it just wasn't practical to keep the place. And so without much fanfare, Blanco was sold. I don't remember consciously saying goodbye to the house, to the animals, to my childhood. And now, over 15 years later, I still dream about that home away from home. The cold, clear water of the Blanco River that we swam and fished in year after year. Whisper the confessions from bunk bed to bunk bed. The time I told Colin to pick up a crab and it turned out to be a scorpion that stung with a vengeance neither of us will ever forget. My time in Blanco gave balance to an otherwise quite urban childhood. It was there I fell in love with reading and performing and the stories my dad told around the campfire. I went back a few years ago, and nothing much had changed, at least from what I could tell standing outside the gate. That new family lives there now, as evidenced by the tricycles and four-wheelers out front. But the sight of that porch swing swinging in the breeze, it brought tears to my eyes. In my mind's eye, I pictured all of us there. My free-spirited mama, my strong and capable dad, adorable brothers and sister, and myself as a girl, this tiny redhead with a big smile, nursing a baby goat with such ease, all of us just enjoying being together. I felt with piercing clarity that Blanco lives on within me and continues to work its magic on my family from the place it holds in our hearts. I breathed in the fresh, clean air and felt the passage of time, my childhood long behind me, and a family of my own still a dream yet to be realized. As I stood in the gateway, I vowed to someday have a place like Blanco for my kids to grow and develop their imaginations, and maybe to keep developing mine too. <laughs> <laughs>